Good evening and welcome to AWARE on the Air, presented by members and friends of AWARE, the anti-war, anti-racism effort of Champaign-Urbana, a local peace group. I'm Carl Esterbrook. We're recording this at noon on Tuesday, April 10th, in the studios of Urbana Public Television, Urbana, Illinois. Our subject is the wars the U.S. government is waging around the world and the racism we display to those we're killing. In accord with the Latin proverb, proprium humane in Janie est, odisse quim laseris. It's human nature to hate those you've injured. At this moment, the U.S. is making war in Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, Pakistan, Somalia, Syria, and Yemen, principally to control the flow of oil out of the Mideast and North Africa, which the U.S. uses as a weapon against its economic rivals from Germany to China. Thousands of U.S. troops are killing people in these countries, though most Americans are barely aware of it. More than a quarter of a million U.S. troops are stationed in a thousand U.S. bases on foreign soil, most of them ringing Russia and China. The 70,000 members of the U.S. Special Operations Command are active in three quarters of the countries of the world. Their activities include kidnapping, we call it rendition, torture, and murder. The rest of the world recognizes, but Americans don't, that they're nothing less than American death squads. The rest of the world recognizes that the U.S. today is what Martin Luther King called it long ago, the greatest purveyor of violence in the world today, an international criminal surpassing all others. But most Americans don't know that, protected as they are by government and media propaganda, what we do here at Aware on the Air is try to encourage our fellow citizens to oppose U.S. government killing around the world. It's just been announced that President Trump will not be attending the Summit of the Americas gathering in Peru this week. Quote, at the President's request, the Vice President will travel in his stead, said White House Press Secretary Sarah Sanders. The President will remain in the United States to oversee the American response to Syria and to monitor developments around the world." Close quote. Trump, who is the weakest American president since Calvin Coolidge, has canceled his declaration last week that we're coming out of Syria. The War Party, the Republicans and Democrats, the CIA and the Pentagon are firmly in charge. We must stop this. Francis Boyle, a friend of AWARE and professor of international law at the little university around the corner, says any U.S. attack targeting the Syrian government or its forces would clearly violate both U.S. and international law. When Obama was in a similar position in 2013, his advisor Ben Rhodes has since commented that they turned back largely because they were afraid of impeachment. That fear is well founded. While the prospect of impeaching Trump is thrown around frequently for partisan purposes, on this issue, the issue of war, the Constitution is clear. Initiating a war or any such attack without authorization is clearly impeachable. Last year at the National Press Club, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, General Joseph Dunford, Jr., claimed the authority to target the Syrian government stemmed from the 2001 authorization for the use of military force passed by Congress. General Dunford was totally incorrect. The AUMF passed after 9-11 has indeed been used to justify the bombing campaign purporting to target ISIS, but it cannot possibly be used to justify targeting the Syrian government. Excuses of humanitarian intervention have no basis in international law, and in these circumstances are transparently hollow. Israel apparently just attacked Syria from the air, illegally, from Lebanese airspace, also illegally. Israel itself just openly admitted that it's killing Palestinian civilian protesters, unarmed, part of a decades-long brazenly, brazenly illegal policy. The U.S. representative to the U.N., Nikki Haley, prevented even an inquiry by the U.N. into the matter. There's no evidence of any humanitarian concern here, simply a search for pretexts to pursue geopolitical goals, which may well include carving up Syria." Close quote. 
That's from our friend Francis Boyle at the local law school. On Sunday, Senator Lindsey Graham uh, said that the entire Syrian Air Force should be destroyed, apparently by bombing it, because Syrian President Assad is, quote, a war criminal, close quote. So massive an attack would be an act of war against a nation that has not attacked us and does not threaten us. Hence, Congress, prior to such an attack, should pass a resolution authorizing a U.S. war on Syria. And as Congress does, it can debate our objectives in this new war and how many men, casualty, and years will be required to defeat the coalition of Syria, Russia, Hezbollah, Iran, and the allied Shiite militias from the Near East. On John Bolton's first day as National Security Advisor, Trump is being pushed to embrace a policy of Cold War confrontation with Russia and a U.S. war with Syria. Yet candidate Trump campaigned against both. The war party that was repudiated in 2016 with the rejection of Hillary Clinton appears to be back in the saddle. But before he makes good on that threat of a, quote, big price to pay, Trump should ask his advisors what comes after the attack on Syria. Lest we forget, there was a reason Obama did not strike Syria for a previous gas attack. Americans rose up as one and said, we do not want another Middle East war. When John Kerry went to Capitol Hill for authorization in the Obama administration, Congress, sensing the national mood, declined to support any such attack. Trump's strike a year ago with 59 cruise missiles on the air base that allegedly launched a sarin gas attack was supported only because Trump was new in office and the strike was not seen as the beginning of a longer and deeper involvement in a war Americans did not want to fight. Does Trump believe that his political base is more up for a major U.S. war in Syria today than it was then? The folks who cheered Trump a week ago when he said we were getting out of Syria, will they cheer him if he announces that we're going deeper in? Before any U.S. attack, Trump should make sure there's more hard evidence that Assad, President Assad launched this poison gas attack than there is that Russia launched that poison gas attack in Salisbury, England. One month after that attack, which Prime Minister, British Prime Minister Theresa May ascribed to Russia and Foreign Minister Boris Johnson laid at the feet of Putin himself, questions have arisen. If the nerve agent used Novichok was of a military variety so deadly it could kill any who came near, why is no one dead from it? Both the target, Sergei Skripal, and his daughter Yulia are recovering. If the deadly poison was, as reported, put on the doorknob of Skripal's home, how did he and Yulia manage to go to a restaurant after being contaminated, with neither undergoing a seizure until later on a park bench? If Russia did it, why are the British scientists at Porton Down now admitting that they have not yet determined the source of the poison? Why would Putin with the prestige of hosting the World Cup in June on the line, perpetrate an atrocity that might have killed hundreds and called, caused nations not only to pull out of the games, but to break diplomatic relations with Russia. U.S. foreign policy elites claim Putin wanted Trump to win the 2016 election. But if Putin indeed wanted to deal with Trump, why abort all such prospects with a poison gas murder of a has-been KGB agent in Britain, America's foremost ally. The sole beneficiaries of the gas attacks in Salisbury and Syria, if they happened, appear to be the war party in the U.S. Those in the U.S., in the Republican and Democratic Party, in the Pentagon and the CIA, that are promoting war with Russia. You're listening to Aware on the Air, and the following comes from uh, Awareist Karen Aram. The United States and NATO are on the brink of a major escalation of the war in Syria, which could lead to a direct clash with nuclear-armed Russia. Amid a wave of labor unrest throughout the United States and Europe, coupled with acute domestic political crises, 
the ruling elite see in war a means not only of reversing a series of geopolitical setbacks in the Middle East, but also of cracking down on political opposition. The United States, Britain, France, and Germany are all being shaken by a growing strike movement amid crisis and turmoil within the political establishment in the state. On the very day that U.S. President Trump met with his National Security Council to decide on military action against Syria, the FBI raided the office and residences of Trump's personal lawyer, escalating the conflict raging within the American ruling class. The potential consequences of a war against Syria are massive. Last month, Russian Chief of Staff Valery Gerasimov vowed to retaliate against any attack on Russian troops in Syria, declaring, quote, in the event of a threat to the lives of our servicemen, Russia's armed forces will take retaliatory measures against the missiles and launchers used, close quote. On Monday, Gerasimov again warned, we have to say once again that military interference in Syria is absolutely unacceptable and can lead to very grave consequences." Close quote. Such statements underscore just how close the world is to war between nuclear-armed powers, threatening the lives of millions of people and human civilization itself. The pretext for this escalation is the chemical weapons attack alleged by the U.S. without any substantiation to have been carried out by the Syrian government. This casus belli, reason for war, is the crudest of fabrications. What possible reason could there be for the Assad regime to sustain such an attack under conditions where it has routed the U.S.-backed Islamist re rebels on the outskirts of Damascus and is in the strongest position since the early stages of the U.S. fomented civil war in Syria? The media hysteria over the alleged gas attack is in line with the relentless campaign of provocations and threats against Russia, a campaign that has reached a new crescendo in recent weeks. The latest allegations take place within days of the discrediting of the claims that Russia was responsible for the supposed chemical poisoning in Salisbury, England, of ex-double agent Sergei Skripal and his daughter. Trump has issued a series of tweets that proclaim the Syrian government guilty of, quote, horrendous crimes, charging Russia and Iran with complicity and promising that those responsible will pay, quote, a big price. The U.S. media, military intelligence apparatus, and political establishment are baying for blood. Republican Senator John McCain blamed Trump's inaction in Syria for emboldening Washington's enemies. Nancy Pelosi, the Democratic Party leader in the House of Representatives, signaled her support for military action against Syria while demanding that the Trump administration, quote, finally provide a smart, strong, and consistent strategy to overthrow the regime of President Bashar al-Assad. France and Britain have said they will join the U.S. attack in Syria, if invited, or even mount their own strikes. The New York Times cited a Trump administration official as saying that Washington is feeling pressure to hasten an American attack on Syria, quote, lest French President Emmanuel Macron do so first. Last week saw a furious dispute within the American ruling elite, including the senior most levels of the Trump administration as the Pentagon, the CIA, the Democrats, and much of the Republican Party leadership successfully pushed back against Trump's suggestion that U.S. troops would be coming home from Syria. Trump was bluntly told that such a pullout would not only be to the benefit of Russia, but would also cut across Trump's plans to intensify economic and military pressure on Iran by torpedoing the Iran nuclear accord. Vladimir Putin and the regime of capitalist oligarchs he heads have long sought an accommodation with Washington. But U.S. imperialism, under successive administrations, has made clear that it would be satisfied only with Russia's semi-colonial subjugation. That Moscow, in the face of NATO's expansion to its borders, 
U.S.-sponsored color revolutions in neighboring states, and a quarter century of U.S. wars across North Africa, the Middle East, the Balkans, and Central Asia, has intervened to disrupt Washington's plans in Ukraine and Syria, is deemed by Washington and Wall Street to be intolerable. The real causes of the United States' reckless provocations against Russia have nothing to do with meddling in U.S. politics or with an alleged poison gas attack. In the quarter century since the dissolution of the USSR, U.S. imperialism sought to reverse the erosion of its global economic position through aggression and war. In its quest for world hegemony, the United States has raised and tired countries such as Libya and Iraq. But Washington's never-ending wars have failed to reverse its decline. Instead, they've metastasized into military strategic offensive against Russia and China, and official declarations from Washington that the U.S. is involved in a new age of great power conflict. The eruption of U.S. militarism is accelerated by deepening economic crisis. In an article titled, Cracks Form and Global Growth Story, Rattling Investors, published Monday, the Wall Street Journal warned, quote, investor confidence has flagged amid fears that a long expected global synchronized surge may be turning into a synchronized stall. And speaking of the economy, the world economy as a whole. More importantly, the ruling, uh, the ruling elite sees war as the most expedient means of attacking democratic rights at home in order to crush the growing upsurge of the popular classes. On Tuesday, Facebook CEO Mark Zuckerberg will testify before Congress amid demands that, foreign, that major technology firms implement even more aggressive measures to crack down on foreign propaganda and fake news. Against the backdrop of a major new military conflict, calls will, calls will be redoubled for the banning of political opposition and its objections. What the 1% in the U.S. and abroad is worried about is the opposition mainstream media dismisses as populist. Populist is described as an ideology that, quote, pits a virtuous and homogeneous people against a set of elites and dangerous others who are together depicted, depicted as depriving or attempting to deprive the sovereign people of their rights, values, prosperity, identity, and voice." Close quote. Populism is variously described as right or left, but that's not the point. The point is that it is a popular uprising. Recent examples include the demonstrations in Iran, the Trump campaign, the Sanders campaign, Brexit, the vote to leave the EU in Britain the Le Pen and Mélenchon, Mélenchon campaigns in France, the Five Star and League campaigns in Italy. Populist parties are forming a government in that country right now, and the AFD in democracy. These various groups are described uh, only by establishment convention as right-wing, some of them are even called left-wing, but right-wing normally means support for the wealthy. Populism supports the opponents of wealth. The U.S. political establishment, the major party organizations, the intelligence community, the leading media like the New York Times and the Washington Post and their pundits understands this as their sneers at populism shows. You're watching Aware on the Air. We're talking about the uh, situation that uh, impends war, more war in the Middle East and economic dislocation here at home and the attempt by the American government by war and repression to control that. There are obvious signs that the time for a massive anti-war movement in the U.S. is now. The alleged new chemical incident in Syria reminds us of a similar series of events we saw last year. We're told to believe that each time the U.S. pulls back 
from war on Syria, which it supports all along, but uh, various degrees of involvement of American troops and air power, the Syrian government is responding with a chemical attack that pulls the U.S. back in. That seems uh, very odd in all sorts of ways, but it's very clear that there, are, uh, there is a war party in the United States that wants to see these chemical attacks, if they exist at all, as an excuse for attacks on Syria. If you're genuinely against U.S. wars for profit, power, and empire, the current moment represents our best opportunity to push back aggressively and launch a real grassroots anti-war movement. The entrenched forces will stop at nothing to get their war with Iran and Russia going seem to believe that time is running out. As such, they're resorting to increasingly comical and preposterous interpretation of events to get their conflagration going. The war sales pitch has become increasingly desperate and nonsensical, which provides, which provides us with a window of opportunity to push back. It's hard to keep track of the timeline of events of these days, but it was just last week that the British Foreign Office was caught deleting a tweet in which it had falsely claimed it confirmed the nerve agent used in the scrypal poisoning had been produced in Russia. As the British paper The Guardian reported, quote, Boris Johnson, the British Foreign Minister, is facing an embarrassing question over his claims that Russia had produced the Salisbury nerve agent after it emerged that the Foreign Office had deleted a tweet blaming Moscow for the attack. With the Foreign Secretary already under pressure over his remarks two weeks ago that a Porton Down scientist, a laboratory, uh, had been absolutely categorical that the Novichok had originated in the country, in Russia, Jeremy Corbyn accused Johnson, Jeremy Corbyn, the head of the Labour Party, and with any luck, the next Prime Minister of Britain, Jeremy Corbyn accused Johnson of, quote, completely exceeding the information he'd been given after the emergence of a deleted tweet, after the emergence of the deleted tweet. But Johnson later hit back, accusing the Labour leader of, quote, playing Russia's game. The madness of Russia in the U.S. is mirrored in the U.K. The deletion of the Foreign Office's lie, immediately seized on by the Russian Embassy, has deepened the government's difficulties, the UK government's difficulties, after British scientists at the British Defense Research Laboratory announced on Tuesday they had not established that the nerve agent used to poison Sergei and Yulia Skripal had been made in Russia. Fortunately for the US government, Syria's Bashar al-Assad decided to do something completely suicidal and entirely against his best interest in the immediate aftermath of the Skripal narrative falling apart. How incredibly convenient for those itching to get a war with Iran and Russia going. So where do things stand? For those of us against imperial war, the current moment offers the best opportunity I can recall to be, build a real movement. The Syrian, and by extension Iranian and Russian, war sales pitch has become so clownish and desperate, a significant percentage of people simply aren't falling for it. I've been extremely critical in this program of Trump's supporters I call cheerleaders, who always make excuses for everything Trump does because they've become enamored with a cult politician and can't admit they were wrong about him. The exact same thing happened with Obama's cheerleaders. Both men run, ran against the wars, remember? And their stubborn refusal to admit the obvious about Obama's imperial oligarch coddling policies gave him the space he needed to further entrench the corrupt power structure in American political and economic life. Whether Obama or Trump, it's always a president's cult supporters who give them the needed space to push through the worst policies, and his supporters are the same people. Interestingly, this latest push for war with Syria, Iran, and Russia finally seems a bit much for many Trump supporters to stomach. They listen to him about non-interventionism during the campaign. I've seen considerable evidence that this is the case over the last several days, and I hope it continues. 
The following poll conducted by Trump's favorite show, Fox and Friends, is particularly revealing. As of the time of publication, over 50,000 people had voted, with 68% against U.S. military action. This is encouraging and highlights how crucial the current moment is to build pressure against another idiotic and disastrous war. Uh, the lines are unclear. Uh, Fox News, for example, has carried severe attacks against Trump's plans to expand the war in Syria and support for his assertion last week that we come out of Syria. If Trump voters who claim, who claim to be anti-war provide Trump with cover to proceed with a neocon foreign policy, then that is exactly what you'll get especially since that's also what the resistance and the U.S. bipartisan cadre of imperialists want in the Republican and Democratic Party and the so-called intelligence community. The only way to make Trump really sweat is if a unified front consisting of his base, the anti-war left, libertarians and others push back aggressively and simultaneously. I think the time is right for such an anti-war movement. The biggest obstacle we face in achieving this end is ourselves, since the American public is all too often its own worst enemy. Too much of the U.S. population is so polarized and convinced their team is right about everything, they'll never unite to protest against something as monumentally significant as imperial war if they feel the other side is also against it. This attitude is extremely childish, but it's also pervasive. The American public's been so divided and conquered, so tribal and belligerent against those from the other political tribe, we can't even come together to push back on an issue as existential as regime change war. We have a great opportunity to do so now, but will we take the bull by the horns and unite, or will we once again be easily fragmented into tribes the moment the media decides to inflame some new wedge issue. I don't know the answer, but I knew that until Americans from various political ideologies can put other differences aside and remain on this extremely important issue, the public will continue to be easy prey for those who really want to run the show and really want this war. I'm not naive enough to think an anti-war movement will prevent the next disastrous imperial war, but that doesn't mean it shouldn't be a key strategic goal of the citizenry. Unless the American public learns to stop being so tribal, the imperialist oligarchy will continue to do whatever it wants. Forming an anti-war movement capable of crossing ideological lines would be one thing that could truly terrify the entrenched status quo and put them on notice. Our real power as humans doesn't come from voting for the latest false prophet who will inevitably betray us. Our real power will be discovered once we're able to look beyond our differences, when we stop demanding ideological conformity on every issue, and come together to impose something meaningful that clearly goes the best interests of 99% of us. One of those issues is imperial war, and the time to come together is now. You're listening to Aware on the Air, presented by members and friends of Aware, the anti-war, anti-racism effort of Champaign-Urbana, a local peace group, in the 15th week of 2018. Another week in which the world can see that the most extensive global terrorism is worldwide war making by the United States. My thanks tonight, as usual, to Dr. No, J.B. Nicholson for research, C. No's notes on the Facebook page for Aware on the Air, along with articles referred to tonight and some other things. We will conclude tonight with a piece from Telesur, a Latin American television network sponsored by the governments of Venezuela, Cuba, Nicaragua, Uruguay, and Bolivia. In an interview with longtime anti-war figure Noam Chomsky, Chomsky puts the two great threats of nuclear war and climate change into the context of follow, how following the U.S. greatest, latest distraction, war in the Middle East, means no headlines for those great threats. My thanks to Dr. No for 
finding this interview for, for us. Our show is produced and directed by Jason Liggett, Nathan Young, and Andrew Scholarly. Thanks to him also, this program and others like it will be available on YouTube and archive.org. There is an AWARE anti-war demonstration this Saturday, 2 to 4 p.m. at Main and Neal Streets in Champaign. No war in Syria will be the theme. AWARE meeting this Sunday, uh, 5 to 6 p.m. at the Hammerhead Coffee Shop at University Avenue and Wright Street in Campus Town. For members and friends and aware of AWARE are uh, invited to attend this informal meeting. Finally, AWARE honors those who reveal the crimes of the U.S. government, which the rest of the world knows about but Americans don't, Manning, Assange, Snowden, and others, truth tellers persecuted by the U.S. government. The isolation of Julian Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy in Britain must stop. Julian Assange, the principal figure in the WikiLeaks group, uh, has been uh, silenced by the government of Ecuador. They have a new government, uh, which gave him a, uh, asylum a while ago. We call on the government of Ecuador to allow Julian Assange his right of freedom of speech. It was ever, if it was ever clear that the case of Julian Assange and WikiLeaks was never just a legal case, but a struggle for the protection of, human, of basic human rights, it's now. Citing his critical tweets about the recent detention of Catalan President Carlos Puigdemont in Germany, and following pressure from the U.S., Spanish, and U.K. governments, the Ecuadorian government has installed an electronic jammer to stop Assange communicating with the outside world via the internet and phone. As if in ensuring his total isolation, the Ecuadorian government is also refusing to allow him to receive visitors. Despite two UN rulings describing his detention as unlawful and mandating his immediate release, Assange has been effectively imprisoned since he was first placed in isolation in Wandsworth Prison in London in December 2010. He's never been charged with a crime. The Swedish case against him collapsed and was withdrawn, while the United States have stepped up efforts to prosecute him. His only crime is those of a true journalist, telling the world the truths that people have a right to know. Under its previous president, a graduate of the University of Illinois, the Ecuadorian government bravely stood against the bullying might of the United States and granted Assange political asylum as a political refugee. International law and morality of human rights was on his side. Today, under extreme pressure from Washington and its collaborators, another government in Ecuador justifies its gagging of Assange by stating that Assange behavior, quote, Assange behavior through his messages on social media put at risk good relations which this country, Ecuador, has with the UK, the rest of the EU, and other nations, close quote. The censorious attack on free speech is not happening in Turkey, Saudi Arabia, or China. It's right in the heart of London. If the Ecuadorian government does not cease its unworthy action, it too will become an agent of persecution rather than a valiant nation that stood up for freedom and free speech. If the EU and the UK continue to participate in a scandalous silencing of a true dissident in their midst, it will mean that free speech is indeed dying in Europe. This is not just a matter of showing support and solidarity. We're appealing to all who care about basic human rights to call on the government of Ecuador to continue defending the rights of a courageous free speech activist, journalist, and whistleblower. We ask that its basic human rights be respected as an Ecuadorian citizen, an internationally protected person, that he not be silenced or expelled. If there is no freedom of speech for Julian Assange, there is no freedom of speech for any of us, regardless of the disparate opinions we hold. This is a letter signed by dozens of international figures, uh, extremely important uh, for all of us. F uh, now this is Carl Esterbrook for Karen Aram, Karen Evans Levy, Stuart Levy, David Green, Ed Mandel, and other members and friends of AWARE, saying in the words of the late Edward Murrow, good night and good luck.
Noam Chomsky, who might be the most important linguist in the world and one of the most influential intellectuals over the last decades, welcomes Telesur in his small office at Tucson University, where he just moved in. His reflections are heard carefully by the international political community. Today, he speaks about humanitarian interventions, the challenges we must face as a globalized society, and the role of the new US American president, Donald Trump. From the point of view of US power, he's harming it. But from the point of view of US elites, he's giving them everything they want. I mean, in fact, what's going on in the United States, if you think about it, is kind of a two-level uh, wrecking ball, if you want to call it that. Uh, Trump, his role, whether this is conscious or not, I don't know, but you can see what, what's happening. Trump's role is to ensure that the media and its public attention are always concentrated on him. So every time you turn on a television set, it's Trump. They open the front page of the newspaper, Trump. And in order to maintain, he's a con man, basically, a showman. And in order to maintain uh, public attention, you have to do something crazy. Otherwise, nobody's going to pay attention to you. If you do normal things, you'll be you know, way back somewhere. So every day, there's one insane thing after another. And then, you know, the media he makes some crazy lie. You know, he had the biggest crowd in history or something. The media looks at him and says, no, it wasn't the biggest crowd. But meanwhile, he's on to something else. And then you go to that one. And while this show is going on in public, the, uh, well, in the background, uh, the wrecking crew is working. Uh, Paul Ryan, Mitch McConnell, uh, um, the guys in the cabinet who write bill. his uh, executive orders. And what they're doing is systematically dismantling every aspect of bill. government that works for the benefit of the population. Uh, this goes from workers' rights to uh, uh, pollution, pollution, pollution of the environment, uh, uh, the, uh, rules for uh, protecting consumers. I mean, anything you can think of is being dismantled. And all efforts are being devoted, kind of almost with fanaticism, to enrich and empower their actual constituency, which is super wealth and corporate power, who are delighted. That's why the stock market goes up. Stock market has not much to do with the economy, but keeps booming because that's the rich people, and they love being granted. Now, the worst policies that he's carrying out, the most dangerous, are barely discussed. Now, those are uh, the two existential threats that we face. You have to face the fact that humans are now in a situation which has never arisen in human history. Now, this generation has to decide uh, whether organized human existence is going to continue. And it's not a joke. It's uh, global warming and nuclear war. Those are the major issues. They ought to be big headlines every day. And Trump's uh, actions are making both of them much more dangerous. In the case of nuclear war, the policies are significantly increasing the threat of nuclear war. In the case of global warming, it's almost indescribable that not only has the US pulled out uniquely alone in the world, it's pulled out from the international efforts to do at least something about it. But beyond that, it's the Trump administration is going out of its way to increase the threat. Uh, look, listen to his State of the Union address. Uh, the only phrase about global climate was to talk about our beautiful clean coal, uh, the worst polluter there is, uh, which we have, uh, we have a thousand years of it, you know. And uh, look at the new budgets that's coming out. Sharply cuts research and support for any kind of renewable energy, more subsidies and support for the most polluting, destructive things. And, and it's not just Trump. It's the entire Republican leadership. So if you look at the 2016 election, at the primaries, every single candidate, not a single exception, either denied that global warming is taking place 
or said maybe it is, but we shouldn't do anything about it, which I think is worse. They were called the moderates, like uh, Kasich. So they, and if you look at Trump himself, or say Rex Tillerson, Secretary of State, they know perfectly well that humans are causing global warming. In fact, uh, Trump has golf courses all over him. He's, he hasn't built a wall in Mexico yet, but he's building walls around his golf courses to make sure that the sea level doesn't destroy them. Uh, Rex Tillerson was CEO of ExxonMobil. Uh, since the 1970s, scientists at ExxonMobil have been, uh, we now know they've been uh, made public, forced to be made public. They've been producing severe warnings to the leadership about the effect of the use of uh, petroleum on destroying the environment. So they all know about it, but they're not doing anything about it, which is a level of uh, criminality that is almost hard to find words to describe. I mean, here are you know, educated, uh, well-off, uh, rich uh, people, upper elite, who know that what they're doing is destroying the prospects for Thank human organized human life and do it anyway because they make more profit tomorrow. Uh, can you think of an analog to that in human history? I, I really can't. I mean, I've said sometimes uh, what's considered an out utterly outrageous comment that the today's Republican Party is the most dangerous organization in human history. Sounds outrageous, but think about it for a moment. I mean, Hitler didn't intend to destroy the prospects for human existence. Uh, Attila the Hun didn't intend that. Nobody has. But that's what these guys intend. And it's not ignorant, uneducated, you know, religious fundamentalists, whatever you want to you know, blame people. These are the most educated, uh, best supported people in the world. And they're doing this eyes open because you can make more profit tomorrow. It's hard to imagine anything like it. And it's, it's not just my opinion. It takes, say, the uh, bulletin of the atomic sign, the doomsday clock, famous doomsday clock. It's, set up by the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists since 1947. They, each year they gather distinguished physicists, political analysts, others to look at the state of the world and make a judgment of how far we are from terminal disaster. Midnight is terminal disaster. In 1947, the clock was set seven minutes to midnight it's after the atom bomb. Moved up and back since. Now it's at the closest it's been to midnight ever. That's, they just moved it to two minutes to midnight. That's where it was in 1953 when the U.S. and later the USSR exploded uh, thermonuclear weapons which were could totally destroy the world. So it went to two minutes. Now it's back to two minutes. And that's the Republican Party. That's the ones who are running the country and dominating the world. There's never been a situation like this does not have the economic power that it once did. Uh, econ U.S. control of the world actually peaked in 1945. It's been declining ever since. There's a lot of talk about America's decline, but it's quite misleading. The peak was 1945. The U.S. had power that had absolutely no counterpart in all of history. The U.S. probably had close to half the world's wealth. It had incredible security, controlled the Western Hemisphere, controlled both others, oceans, uh, controlled the opposite size of both oceans, uh, just about everything. Uh, but it started to collapse pretty quickly. In 1949, China became independent, uh, which is described in an interesting way. Like, uh, I can lose my computer, but I can't lose your computer, right? But the loss of China implies the tacit understanding we own the world and if something gets out of control we lost it and that was not a small thing it became a huge issue in american life uh, who was responsible for the loss of china then you get mccarthyism the repression the destruction of unions an enormous thing it goes on and on uh, kennedy when he was trying to decide whether to escalate in vietnam he told his advisors uh, 
I don't want to be responsible for the loss of Indochina, you know, and right up to the present, you know. So, and that, that's, that was a serious decline. It changed American policy. And since then, Europe reconstructed, the industrial societies reconstructed. They'd been devastated by the war. Uh, de, you know, decolonization took place. The world just became more diverse. By about 1970, the U.S. Uh, owner, uh, control of the world economy was down to maybe 25 percent, which is enormous, but not 50 percent. And the world was economically what was called tripolar. There was a German-based Europe, a U.S.-based North America, and at that time Japan-based East Asia, which was the most rapidly developing region, now China-based. Uh, and it's continued since. I mean, the U.S. by now has maybe 20% of the world economy, and by, by f f in military terms, there's just nobody nearby. The you know, U.S. spends practically as much as the rest of the world combined, technologically way more advanced, and so on. Uh, but in uh, economic terms, it's somewhat declined. However, that's very misleading, because these investigations uh, by political scientists, um, diplomats, and so on, talk about national power. But in the modern world, especially since the 90s, since uh, neoliberal globalization took place, that's not really a measure of control. Now, the real measure of control is which corporations own things. And it turns out, if you do a study, that US-based multinationals own about half the world, which is enormous. Now, they are very closely integrated with the state. The state supports them. They pretty much run the state. And they have about 50, in, in practically every sector, manufacturing, uh, retail, commerce, finance, U.S. corporations are first. Uh, and, 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 that's the real, and that's combined with national power. So you really have to rethink what, it, what power means. It means lots of things in a diverse world. But the U.S. You know, still remains supreme by far. We all know what that means. Protection of the nation from foreign terrorist entry into the United States. That's big stuff. First of all, I, I think one should be cautious about talking about the CIA. The CIA does not act on its own. The CIA is an agency of the executive branch. And they, there's almost no exception to this. They just do what they're told. Their, one of their jobs is uh, to allow uh, a kind of denial, like, like the executive can say, I, I didn't know this was happening. So Gentlemen, it's, uh, you can blame things, if something goes wrong or there's some atrocity, you, know, Senator, you can say the CIA is responsible the work, the women, and the, the executive branch, which is <clears throat> giving the orders, has uh, the possibility of denial, you know. So when we talk about the CIA, we're really talking about the executive I, uh, branch of the government. The and yes, they behave they differently. So for example, Latin America during the last 20 years has pretty much thrown them out. Now the last one <coughs> you may remember was in Ecuador, the Manta, and uh, Correa, Rafael Correa, told the United States that they could keep the base if he could put one in Miami which is an indication of the shift in relations. U.S. power is extensive, undoubtedly, but it's not what it was. The IMF, basically an agency of the Treasury Department, has been pretty much thrown out of Latin America. So there, is a, there are prospects. Well, the concept of humanitarian intervention is a very interesting one. Almost every act by any great power is uh, aggressive act is justified on humanitarian grounds. So from the point of view of the aggressor, it's a humanitarian intervention, not from the point of view of the victims. And it's probably if we had uh, records from Attila the Hun, we might find the same thing. But what is counted? The one, the one, one that is counted is the bombing of Serbia and 
1999, the Kosovo bombing. So take a look at that. It was a kind of an ugly place, you know, not a pleasant place. But we know in detail what was going on there. Uh, guerrilla uh, forces, Albanian forces based in Albania were entering Serbia, uh, carrying out terrorist attacks in order to elicit a harsh Serbian response, which could be used as a justification for NATO, in, meaning US, intervention. And they said the casualties are kind of separated on both sides. They estimated about 2,000. Uh, when the invasion was undertaken, the uh, Wesley Clark, the general in charge, he informed Washington that the result of the US attack would be to sharply escalate atrocities uh, because when you, Serbia was not going to be able to respond by bombing the United States, so they'd respond on the ground. Uh, as the invasion began, he informed the press, which wouldn't report it, that the predictable, his word, effect of the bombing would be to sharply escalate Serbian atrocities, which is what happened. US started bombing Serbia, Serbia started driving out uh, Albanians from Kosovo, uh, carrying out atrocities, uh, huge reporting and denunciation of Serbian atrocities. Uh, Milosevic was uh, brought to the criminal court with an indictment for his massive crimes. All, with one minor exception, were after the bombing. Uh, if you look back at the discussion, uh, the way it's framed is it was a humanitarian intervention because we had to stop uh, Serbian atrocities. And that's the way it's presented in the West. You have to keep quiet about the fact that the Serbian atrocities were the consequence, the predicted and expected consequence of the invasion. And whenever that's, so for example, there's a major report by uh, distinguished international lawyers headed by Judge Goldstone, a distinguished South African lawyer, which studied the invasion and it concluded its phrase was illegal but legitimate. Illegal because an obvious violation of international law, but legitimate because you had to stop these horrible atrocities which followed the in invasion. So they simply inverted the chronology, which is what is usually done. Occasionally, it's recognized that, yeah, was afterwards, but they said it doesn't matter because you had to stop it before they happened. So we invaded in order to prevent atrocities which were caused by the invasion. So that's the major humanitarian intervention. And shortly after the invasion, the issue of humanitarian intervention was placed on the international agenda because there had been this marvelous example of it. And, and there are two different uh, conclusions drawn. One was by the United Nations. The United Nations General Assembly had a strong resolution about uh, what's Good called morning. responsibility to protect. It basically today, reiterates Sorry. international Sorry. law. It says explicitly that no military act can be taken the unless the authorized by the Security the Council. Anything else is illegal and unacceptable. And it goes on to urge that pressures be used to, pr to ensure that governments don't repress their own population. So use whatever diplomatic and other pressures you can do. That's, that's the f formal responsibility to protect. There's another one. Uh, a, a, a commission was set up, headed by uh, 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 Gareth uh, Evans, the former Australian Prime Minister's, the Evans Commission. Uh, and that it gives a long discussion of responsibility to protect. It's about the same as the uh, UN version with one difference. It has a paragraph saying, in case the Security Council doesn't agree to authorize intervention, regional groupings can intervene on their own by force subject to subsequent approval by the Security Council. Well, which regional grouping is capable of intervening? There's one, it's called NATO. So what this was saying is 
even though the Security Council doesn't authorize it, NATO is justified in intervening. And when you look at the discussion of this, uh, always they say a respons intervention, responsibility to protect is legal because the, universe, the UN Assembly authorized it, but then the version that's adopted is the Evans version. And it's a beautiful example of the way propaganda operates in a well-functioning, powerful system. You take a look at the scholarly literature, media coverage, everything else. So the bombing of Libya was humanitarian intervention. Actually, it was invited. It was there was all kind of stories about Gaddafi's doing this and that. He's not a nice guy doing ugly things, but that had nothing to do with it. Uh, there was a resolution, UN resolution, which called for establishing a no-fly zone and moving towards diplomatic. Uh, moves to settle the problem. Gaddafi accepted it. The in, resolution was initiated by Britain, France, and the United States, who instantly violated, instantly becoming the air force of the opposition, and went on to a uh, big bombing attack. Uh, finally, it ended up murdering Gaddafi, uh, ended up killing probably 10,000 or more people, much more than anything that had happened before. It, left Libya a total wreck as it is today with, uh, in the hands of warring militias. Uh, uh, there was a huge flow of jihadis and arms uh, into the Levant, you know, West Asia, but also mainly into West Africa, which has now become the major source of radical terrorism in the world, uh, largely a consequence of the so-called humanitarian intervention in Libya. And you look at case after case, and that's what they're like. Occasionally, you can find an example that maybe you could argue is humanitarian intervention, but those are, but those are not permitted because the U.S. bitterly opposed them, fought against them, and it's the wrong people anyway, even the wrong color. You know? So that's humanitarian intervention. Well, in, this, in the case of Afghanistan, Afghanistan and Iraq are different. In the case of Afghanistan, I suspect it was just revenge. It's just probably pretty much like what Abdul Haq said. They want to show their muscle. You know, somebody attacked us, we're going to show the world that we can attack somebody even more harshly. And so it's like when Trump says to Korea, you know, we've got, I've got a bigger button than you do, that kind of thing. So we'll show it to you. And uh, because there was really no strategic or other purpose behind it. Iraq was quite different. Uh, Iraq is the country they wanted to invade because it has huge resources uh, right in the midst of the major oil producing region in the, in the world. Uh, there's a major strategic goal is to gain control of Iraq, be able to exploit its oil, uh, set up military bases there, which was in fact by the end, by the end of the Bush years, uh, 2007, it was conceded publicly to have been the primary goal. But uh, so that you can understand on some traditional imperial grounds. But I suspect Afghanistan really was pretty much what Abdul Haq said.